everybody, and welcome back to Brainstorm Brewery. It is pre-release time. Theros Beyond Death. Or, if you're anything like us on coverage last weekend, uh, you've already done one event with these cards when you didn't know anything about them. And everything's old news by now. But for the rest of you, it's pre-release week. So welcome to the show. Uh, we have a great set review lined up. I know everyone loves Theros Beyond set reviews. Me, DJ, and Jason are going to come up with some five under five as best we can for the cards we think have potential. But more importantly, we have somebody on this episode who might actually know what they're talking about, unlike us. So Cat Light, welcome back to the show. You are now stuck doing set reviews with us. I, I apologize, <laughs> but uh, you know. Forever. That's it. well, <laughs> but you, you, you did somehow it, willingly. You, you expressed a polite amount of enthusiasm. <laughs> when we asked you the first time, we we're like, well, this is just the your thing you do now. Yep, and y'all make them enjoyable, so there we go. Well, it's glad to hear. I mean, we were talking about some of our best um, set review guests ever, and I mean, it is a tough bar to live up to because Shaheen Sarani comes on the podcast and says that Smuggler's Copter is bad. And according to Jason, he also said that Oko was bad. So I don't know if you can really live up to that, but I'm glad that you're going to try. He Definitely a tall order. <laughs> I have a really good record of saying cards are going to be really good and then tweeting 24 hours later, back t- backpedaling and saying not to buy them and then those cards being good anyway. <laughs> I, was so like, Ember- is- I was like, Ember Cleave is a hot card. Buy it at $4. It's actually insane. And then I tweeted. I was like, next day I woke up. I was like, nope, never mind. Don't listen to me. And then it was $3,500. So. <laughs> we call that the Shaheen Sarani school of card evaluation. Or when Jacob Van Lunen came on, he's like, Voice of Resurgence is the only good card in Dragon's Maze. We're like, Psh, whatever, idiot. What about Debridge chant? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he won a Pro Tour, so that one might have actually been a Well, <laughs> I made about as much money as he did winning the Pro Tour on Debridge chant because somebody put it in their sideboard that first weekend and it went to 10. And we were all holding copies. That was a good time. <laughs> right, well, there you go. For okay, more speculative so. analysis about the year 2013, tune in the brainstorm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, before we we jump in, Kat, do you want to uh, tell people who are listening where they can find you on the internet, uh, what it is you do in Magic, and uh, why basically you're smarter than all of us? <laughs> uh, so you can find me on Twitter, and I also have a YouTube channel where I do tournament vlogs. Uh, I in Magic, I play magic competitively every weekend on the star city games tour and that i feel like that gives me a lot to say about modern and the constructed formats less so like edh but uh that's where y'all come in so it's all good yeah well you've had a lot of success on the series over the past uh, couple years so it's always nice to have you on for these reviews so Mm -hmm. the way we structure these for people uh who don't know we used to just is that we don't we just yeah we we, we've (laughs) done a million things wrong in the past with set reviews, but this time we've cracked it. Basically, we all picked out the five or so cards we want to talk about, and then I will force these guys to talk about uh, the expensive cards that DJ and Jason just want to say, oh, it's too expensive, ignore it. But we will at least touch on them uh, and get Kat's take on whether or not they might actually be playable in standard. So uh, with that said, Jason, I know you had something you wanted to start us off with, so take it away, man. I looked at Throne of Eldraine Data, um, just price graphs over the last three months where stuff was uh, initially offered, where it tanked, where it peaked. And um, I think there are some corollaries with those cards in this set, and I think we can learn something by looking at that data. So I'm just going to real quickly go through that. Mm-hmm. The most expensive card in the set is still Oko. Um, now, Oko is a card that pre-sold for $40, and we all said, Ooh, $40? Um, the lowest Oko has ever been is 20 and its peak was $67, which is kind of insane. Um, so even if you bought at, you know, the, the pre-sale, you could have made, you know, 27 bucks just, uh, just, you know, selling at that peak. But that was like a real crazy weekend where like, is Oko good in every format? And they're like, yeah, it's good in every format. Um, that's a bit of an outlier, I think, but it took about 11 days for Oko to peak. So it was, you know, sort of like there's the. You know, the set's released, then there's like one weekend, and then, you know, the, you know as that data's coming in and people are, you know, gradually buying throughout the week, mm-hmm. um, a bunch of the cards took 10 or 11 days to, to peak. 
Uh, Skill Borrower is next at twenty five bucks. That took about three weeks to peak uh, at thirty four dollars. Brazen, Brazen Borrower. Brazen Borrower, Sk- whatever, yeah. Skill Borrower, Skill Borrower sir, is, is a bulk rare from Shards of Alara that I own 300 copies of, and don't you dare, like, sully its name. That's a much better card. I, I wish it was Skill Borrower. Yeah, Brazen Borrower. Um, so you could have made 14 bucks if you'd uh, bought it, uh, sold at its peak and bought at the pre-sale price of 20 The lowest that got was 12 Um you know that's um that's a card that it, it, it the blue cards I think p- took people a little bit longer to figure out. Questing Beast was twenty three. Oh no, you could have made twenty three bucks. Never mind. It was uh it was like fifteen pre sale and it uh, eleven days in it hit thirty eight. So you had some money to make there. The lowest mm-hmm. it got was seventeen. That's about what it is right now. So it's about at a historic low. Um, but I don't think it's getting it much higher. Um, Passage is the the highest value rare in the set. It's seventeen. It was initially fifteen. It went up to about twenty. So there's there's less fluctuation in the rares. If something's gonna go you know real crazy, it's gonna be a mythic, a rare. There's not much it can do because if you look down the list, there's eleven cards in the set over five dollars, and only four of them are rares. Once yeah. upon a time's all the way down to seven. Murders riders all the way down to six, and goose is down to five fifty. Yeah, I, I mean, like, I yeah. think that Goose and Ryder are the good ones there because there's obviously a lot of noise in the data with Oko and Once Upon a Time and Bannings and all of that. But I mean, Goose and Murderous Ryder are staples across formats. And yeah, so that price is pretty telling. Gilded but Goose chill. is a card that the TCG price is like anywhere from five to six. And we paid mm-hmm. four this past weekend. Yeah. yeah but also on Goose, you look, great. it was like. Twenty dollars, right? When everyone was like, "Oh, we can play a turn two Oko with this." It's it's twenty bucks. The lowest it ever was is four, so it's up from its historic low. But like, it peaked at twenty dollars before the set was even released. So the most the most goose ever was was before the set was released. So, you know, they just the the demand couldn't keep up with the supply of a set that sold a ton. Plus, they had all the other weird boosters and other sets people were buying. Well, so. you said it peaked at that before the set even released. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, like, that's actually not super helpful to people, right? Because no one even has any. Well, but but I'm saying chill out. Yeah. Because yeah, as yeah. much as you could have identified Goose was insane, like, it's it, it's only a little bit above its historic low. It's about mm-hmm. a third of its historic high, and it's a dollar above its historic low. Right. Same thing with Murderous Rider. There's not a ton of fluctuation there, but you wouldn't have lost too much money if you bought at the wrong time on Rider. So there's something to be said for like, Oh, I lost a buck a copy or something like that. It's like, dude, if you just need the card. <laughs> well, especially before... when people, you know, Gilded Goose and Rider, I think were fairly easily and widely identified as cards that were going to be very important and very good. Sure. I think that you're a lot better off if you, if you are just going to kind of suck it up and say, I'm just going to buy my four copies uh, you know, release weekend and, and not have to worry about it, you know, maybe don't go after the $30 Mythics, go after the, you know, 5 to $10 uh, sort of staple cards of a format, not high, high potential, but sort of low, higher variance as well. You know, everyone knew what Gilded Goose and Murderous Rider were going to do. Not everyone knew, for instance, what Oko was going to do, even though... Or Embercleave. Right, or Embercleave. Which was eight, and then it cut in half to four, and then Embercleave kind of took a while. It it took, uh, you know, that 10 days uh, for it to hit 19, and it's it's 13 now, so, you know, it's below its peak, but, like, 10 days in, I guess when people had that first tournament's worth of data, you know, we had some... uh, so yeah, I mean that was when Arena, people sort of I, people sort of identified that this is actually going to be a player in the format. Um, also, obviously, this is a weird time period to look at to an extent because of all the bannings that Sanders undergone. Sure. Um, but you know, if Embercleave took ten days to hit that peak, there weren't bannings at that point, right? So right, and that didn't do anything. That was just an undervalued card. Scions or yeah. Rankle, you know? Right. And Rankle was like a thirty dollars presale card, and then its historic low was seven, which is like right where it is right now. Mm-hmm. So Rankle is just one of those cards like people like the value's got to come from somewhere. And, you know, with the the exception of Oko and uh, Brazen Borrower, basically everything that was super expensive didn't really hold up. You know, mm-hmm. Passage didn't fluctuate that much, but Passage is like this is a forum in a lot of formats. So that's just one of those cards that are like, well, people are going to need a lot of these. Scions, not so much. That was a $38 presale and it's like 11 Ooh. bucks right now. 
Ouch. And the other planeswalker in the set, Garrick, is not even above $5. Yeah. Well, that guy also had, like, a billion copies in this stupid, uh, like, super super special edition, whatever. Mythic edition? It wasn't called that. It was, like, the the collector edition or something like that. The collector... The collector (laughs) something something. I don't know. Sure. But, I mean, that's a... That's that's a like a four dollar mythic also so like that's something worth noting because we've got two planeswalkers in this set and um you know they're not great necessarily so I um, mean Elspeth could be very good I actually like Ashiok too I like Ashiok oh too. there there are three planeswalkers yeah. I was thinking there there are two because there's the the green white guy I'm not super Callus or Calix Alex yeah um, so. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's kind of, I, I'm looking at corollaries for those cards. Mm-hmm. So like anytime you see a corollary, you're like, well, great henge. That's a card that like was, a you know, there was some money to be made on henge. If you had waited a month for it to hit its, you know, historic low of 11 bucks. And then, you know, it's 16 now that price graph is pretty flat though. There wasn't a ton of money to make on henge just because EDH players aren't winning anymore. So you see something like, um, so you look at something like Nyx Bloom Ancient, and you're like, well, this could go to 10 bucks, you know, but it's probably not going to go to 25. So it's just, it's one of those things to look at. If you don't know what the price of Nyx Bloom Ancient's going to do, look at a price graph of Great Henge, and that's going to tell you a lot of information. Yeah, I so think that's a good way to look at it. So if you can find some corollaries for um, for cards we do have three months worth of data on, you're going to know, hey, at 10 days, I better be doing this. At the pre-release, I better be getting out of this and getting into this. You can plan your moves if you look at what Planeswalkers tend to do. You know, Planeswalkers that are played in zero formats, like Garrick versus, you know, Gar- Garrick or Calix versus Planeswalkers that are played in multiple formats, like Scion or, uh, you know, Elspeth. Mm-hmm. So I think you can look at historic data. And you can go back more than one set, too. You can look at what's going on, um, you know, for uh, for War of the Spark also. Although, you know, the, the Planeswalkers are going to throw you way off there. Um, you know, you can kind of figure out what to do. So I'm looking at something like Nyx Bloom, and I'm kind of saying, well, it'll probably go down, and I'll get it then. And it's probably going to bottom out, you know, um, if the Great Henge is, uh, is to be believed. Or to be believed, I think it's probably going to be at its lowest you know, like maybe a month in, but mm-hmm. that's a card that as soon as it were, was released, it went up a couple of bucks because it was 10 bucks on the day release and it peaked at 13 a week later. And then it, it peaked 16 two months later. So the great Henge is one also of those cards. Like, it's just one of the most popular selling cards for us right now. Uh, it's just like a card that we cannot yeah. keep in stock. It's just even at 15 bucks, you can't keep it in stock, which is, you know, crazy. Yeah, card is uh, very good. Um, okay, well, that's great. Are we ready to jump into a five under five? That's our newest gimmick that we'll definitely not regret in a year. <laughs> Name the five uh, cards we like under five dollars that we think there's actually, you know, rather than spend forever talking about a bunch of cards that we all end up ultimately saying are too expensive to buy, uh, we're gonna I you still, know, talk about the ones. Well, we let's let's not get ahead buy. of ourselves. We're still gonna tell you. <laughs> that there are a bunch of cards that are too expensive to buy, but you yeah. berate us into telling you that <laughs> to you want us to convince you that their cards are worth buying, and so you hold a, you hold like a, a knife to our throat, and you're like, "Tell me which cards to buy," and if you're wrong, I'm gonna, yeah. So they really kind of fell off there, DJ. I'm very tired. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, well, that's what happens. We get tired and we're like, tireless tracker, Jesus, we've been doing this for an hour and a half. I don't care about the tease. Whatever. Just I don't want to talk about tireless tracker. And then- Anyways, as we do get into this, any of the cards you do like, I would suggest going to pick up from our sponsor, ChannelFireball.com. Uh, Channel Fireball is running a lot of stuff this year. Just did coverage at the GP. Cad and I will be there doing coverage in Phoenix. So definitely check out CFB for any of your Theros Beyond needs, including trading stuff in from the set once you pick it up pre-release weekend. So who wants to go first with their 5 under 5? I'm picking all five temples, and now I'm logging off of Skype and going to bed. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I will say that temples uh, were one of mine as well, although not the lazy all five route we're seeing DJ take. No, I... 
I got, we brought I got you on this cast to replace Ryan Bouchard, and you were doing it. <laughs> I got other cards. Don't worry. I, I think. What do we think? I mean, temples all seem to be like two dollars right now, but that's got to be that's that's a good price, right? It's fine. It was a good price the first time. Now there are a lot of temples. Yeah. I they mean, randomly but... got reprints in like, you know, dual decks and stuff like that. So there's a lot of temples out there. Um, but I mean, there was a lot of uh, of the um, like Glacial Fortress cycle, too. So, yeah, I mean, um, for what it's worth, th Temple of Epiphany will... is over two dollars right now. They could um, hit five. And the rest are all a dollar to a dollar fifty. So I think that the fact that there is still some strength in these, even when they're not out yet, especially with. I mean, it seems like the blue ones, I guess. Um, so, you know, looking at Temple of Enlightenment or Temple of Deceit here with Theros Beyond. I mean, this is one of those where I would say, right, if you just don't want to mess around waiting on them to bottom out, just go spend the $8 or whatever. Get your play set per I mean, at, at this point, you're just like nickel and dime. Like, it's, it's a couple dollars. Yeah, just go like, get them. If you're planning on playing standard at some point in the next year and a half, just buy Temple's. <laughs> yeah and for what it's worth i mean the first time around temples were a good investment because they ended up being uh quite good in commander obviously after that so they they are going to be played long term i don't know that we can expect the price to to really push up to three or four dollars on on all of them or five dollars or anything like that but you're gonna feel safe going and getting them if the rest of the set's weak five dollars isn't even that unreasonable just because something in a booster pack's got to be worth money uh, well, that's true. This set definitely seems a little more fair than than Eldraine, less obviously powerful. Um, but Throne had eleven cards over five dollars, and that's it. So all five of these aren't going to be above five dollars, right? For sure. Uh, I'll jump in with one that I like a lot uh, as a staple in Standard, um, and possibly Pioneer, I guess. But Shatter the Sky. It's the four mana Wrath. Uh, it's an actual wrath. This is the first four mana white wrath that we've had in ages, right? Since Day of Judgment back in Supreme Zendikar slash verdict? whatever core set it was in. Since Supreme Verdict, sure. But I mean, that's a you said that's white a blue white card, sure. That's blue. It is. Blue. <laughs> Anyways, the point is right. It's been that long since we've had a wrath. Day of Judgment, Supreme Verdict. <laughs> now we have Shatter the Sky, an actual, honestly, God four mana wrath. Each opponent who controls a creature with power four greater draws a card, then you destroy them all. So while you are giving them a little back. Green is so good that green draws cards off of other colors. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's about right. But the card is pre-selling at $3. And, you know, I, I think that's a price you want to get in on these at. I don't know that it's... I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, to see it go end up at five or six. Uh, because it's, it is very good. Um, but regardless, I think you're going to feel absolutely fine just getting in on it now. So I like that one a lot. Kat, do you think this is going to be a big player in standard or maybe, I mean, I guess probably not pioneer where they have verdict, but do you think this is going to make a push in standard? I do think it will. I think that blue white control, there was actually like a couple at the mythic invitational. And I think that that mm -hmm. is an archetype that people really like, but what it was really lacking was an efficient wrath. And I think the draw card side is like actually makes it to where you can play cards like like play the gods or play some creatures in your deck and not get totally oh, yeah. like boned by wrathing. And I think that um, I actually really like the card a lot for standard. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even think about that. The idea of, you know, that the people who draw on a card could be you. And you definitely yep. throw people off in your blue white deck if you play a creature and they're going to be like, okay, well, they're not going to wrath. It's safe to unload onto the board. And then you get them yep. with shatters. Yeah, I mean, the. Exactly. the, the one of the obvious synergies that was pointed out really quickly was uh, that you can use it with the War of the Spark Gideon because he is a four-power creature on your turn. Oh, that's true. And yeah. he also mm -hmm. pluses to make another creature indestructible. So if you have just two creatures in a white weenie deck, you just make two, <laughs> and then you make two creatures sky. indestructible, you play a Wrath that cantrips itself, and then you beat them in the face. I like that. That's a good one. All right. Who, somebody else want to jump in? Let's throw them out. I like Nylia's Intervention at around a dollar. That card's pretty absurd. That's um, on my list as well. I mean, Our card Promise puts the cards into play, which is great, and that's why Our Promise gets so much play, but this has removal as a mode, 
and also it can get more than two lands. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's pretty great because everyone's like, oh, it doesn't put them into play. But like since one is green, had trouble putting extra lands into play in EDH. Yeah. For- it's like, oh, no, I have to use my explanation, my burgeoning, my Azusa or my, you know, you got options. So or the other playing- card in this set, right? The Dryad. Absolutely. Which is you which you can get with Sterling Grove like this sets nuts. Yeah, so for so, those who don't know, Nylea's Intervention is X, green, green, sorcery. You get to choose one of two modes, and one of the modes is deal twice X damage each creature with flying. But the more important mode, I think, is to search your library for up to X, land cards, reveal them, put them into your hand. So, um, like Jason said, that's you You got to find a way to get them into play, but that is any land card, not, you know, this is a four mana. Not, it doesn't say basic. It's right. go this is get four Urborg mana, go get Cabal Coffers. Cabal coffers yeah. yeah. This this card is great. Yeah. It's crazy. It's under a dollar. Yeah, um, you know, and I th- I think it's going to be good. Um, I think we'll be glad we paid a buck on these. Yeah, I mean something like I mean, gosh, at this rate, we're going to be paying fifty cents next week. Uh, it's going to be nice, but uh, I think something like I think these type of effects are are very good. I mean, our promise is a little. That's obviously the best corollary, but and that card's a dollar fifty right now um and it sees a little bit of play and spiked up to 354 dollars when it was seen play in pioneer uh but i think you know that, that this is going to follow in a similar path and stay well over a dollar and it's it's not going to hurt at all that to have these as soon as you can get them all right dj cat what do you guys want to talk about uh i think the red phoenix of ash card will actually see a lot of standard and pioneer play Mm-hmm. Um, Ooh, spicy. I think that card, it reminds me of like Flame Wake Phoenix and Rekindling Phoenix and the fact that it's recurrable. Um, it, you only have to exile three other cards from your yard, which actually isn't that high of a cost. Yeah. Um, and I just think the fact that it also has a mana sink and has haste threat, I think it's just going to be really good in like big red strategies. Yeah, this card has a lot going for it. It's like you said, three to play and then four to escape it. So it's mm-hmm. even on curve, right? Even if they have removal for it, you can still escape it immediately. It escapes with a plus yeah. one counter. It seems very hard to escape on it, it on curve. If Well, you don't want to be escaping it on curve. You want to be beating well, them a couple times, right? Well, that's what Corbin yeah. just said. Is he said you can escape it on curve, and I was like, I don't... Yeah, I mean, it would have to be, like, there'd have to be... I guess I was thinking a, a fetch land format, right? But hey, you get your uh, Pioneer Fabled... Passage action in there. We got bur- one, burn two, spells too. Probably, one, two, three right? drop Fable so, Passage mm-hmm. on turn four. Yeah. Like this is this is probably the easiest creature to escape near curve just because like the deck lends itself to having some burn spells in the yard. Yep. Yeah. And it's only a dollar. So that's one of those if it, you know, if it has a good first weekend, if sort of there's a resurgence of mono red, it certainly curves into Torbrand pretty well, having an invasive yes. threat out and then playing your Torbrand. Um, yeah, it definitely could move from the near bulk status it's at of under a dollar uh, to, to, you know, what, four or five dollars probably release weekend if it were to do well. So it's certainly not a big risk and could pay off pretty well. Uh, in addition to just probably finding a home in standard or maybe even pioneer. Yeah, good pick. I like picking cards. And hoarding them like a pack rat until Wizards prints some dumb thing that has synergy. I have sure. gone on this rant numerous times, so I will keep it brief. Well, but... How many times do they print something that makes it obsolete versus has synergy with it? That's that's a good way to look at that, actually, Jason. Right? It's very rare that it becomes obsolete. Right. And so I, I like picking bulk rares or bulk commons that have just niche, unique effects like Skill Borrower. Um, and so Storm Herald, I think, is my next uh, collection where every time I see one in bulk... I will nick it aside and just keep it to the keep it to the wayside until they print some random nine mana enchantment that you can bring back. Because this card's previewing alone made Eldrazi Conscription go up. And I don't think that's a real deck. I don't think anybody here thinks that's a real deck. But I do think that everybody here thinks that people will think it's a real deck. Well, the people bought on the basis of that dumb hammer that no one's using. So Yeah, like well, Colossus hey, Hammer. I had... And I had that hammer on camera round one of the GP. Get out of here. And, <laughs> and so uh, Storm Herald is up in those cards like Arcanum Wings or like cards with the fortify mechanic. I just I just squirrel those away and I'm like one day Wizards will because they're not going to back check every single card ever made when they print new new sets. I mean, we know that all the time when things get broken. And so Storm Herald is just like 
one day they'll print a 12 mana aura and an aura focus set or just something or other and people will like this a lot this this is the first card that they go to they'll be like oh new aura click storm herald buy and i i think this is a card that you, as a bulk where you just score the boy don't don't pay anything more than that but just just keep your finger on the pulse of the card yeah the card is actually i mean it's just a cool design too right it's pretty fun it is fixed replenish <laughs> yeah that's one yeah that's one way to look at it uh, okay, I'm going to throw out a, a very, an actual bolt card already here. I'm curious uh, to see what Cat thinks of this one especially. But Thrix, the Sudden Storm. This is the 4-5 Flasher from the set. It's a 3 and 2 blue. Flash flying. Spells you cast with converted mana cost 5 or greater costs 1 less to cast and can't be countered. I honestly think that all of that is less relevant than the fact that you can now curve your... You can go bigger than Night Pack Ambusher in your Simic Flash deck if you want. Beside you who swings for four. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Remember, Flash creatures have blue haste. That's what I call it. Blue haste, yeah. Blue haste, I like that. Um, I actually do think that card is good. When I first saw it, to be honest, I thought about Mono Blue Tron in um, Modern. Oh, no. <laughs> <That's> disgusting. <laughs> right? Um, but I do think, I think the card's like just one of those really, like, really good finishers for control decks, which... Um, that because it has flash, but I do, th and I think that it could be good play against like a night, night pack opposing night pack ambushers. That's um, true. I do think it's kind of clunky, but I do also like that it makes is it legendary? It's legendary, it is, right? It is okay. Um, it's basically, I, I think a card that it probably ends up if it goes anything is like a two of, right? Yeah, he's Thrix the sudden storm, not Thrix a sudden storm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. We can really trust their naming conventions. Yeah, Velika, well, Velika, the Molten the Pinnacle. Molten Pinnacle. <laughs> um, I could see it also be playing in like ramp decks potentially, just to like make the the bigger threats uncounterable. But I don't think that that matters as much. I'm not really sure where its home is, but I think the card itself is like baseline very powerful. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think it, all of these things can be true, and it can probably never really get out of the dollar bin or whatever. But it's it's. It's fifty cents market price already, right? So, you it's it's one of the, it's a long shot in terms of a financial move, but it is very cheap. So, uh, yeah. it probably doesn't hurt, right? Uh, and honestly, a lot of the cards in this set uh, that kind of look good aren't under five dollars, right? And like Jason mm -hmm. said, even things that have sort of cross format commander playability, those it's not a thing where you wait six months and then get those. People jump on it. Yeah. immediately so there's not a lot of stuff necessarily for them that the discount is no least. longer built in but yeah well i mean uh, if you go to edh rec and bring up the throne of eldraine you can sort by sets bring up throne of eldraine like a lot of the most played cards are you know rares under five bucks mm -hmm. uh, or mythics that were already identified right yeah and they're just you um, know return of the Sir Conrad and Return of the Wild Speaker are in the top five played cards in the set. Interesting. Arc Arcane Signet, Mystic Sanctuary, Sir Conrad are all top five cards, and they're all common. Or no, Sir Conrad's uncommon, but you, you get my drift. Yes. Like, <laughs> EDH isn't really driving a ton of prices, so it's you know we're seeing a ton of play, and it, it certainly is going to make Faber Alder money someday. We hope, but like right. for the most part, it's got to be standard. Yeah, because again, there are eleven cards from Throne Owl Drain worth more than five dollars, and there was nothing that was worth less than five dollars. You know, yeah. pre-sale that's worth five or more now. And there's just so, so many options in Commander now that, like yeah. I said before, sometimes it'd be like, "Oh, we like this card in Commander; it'll be good forever. Pick it up now, and two years from now, it'll be worth money." And it's, and then it's printed in a brawl deck, or right? And that, the nine yeah. pre-cons we're getting this year. Plus, they print so many just either similarly powerful cards or cards that are just outright better than basically anything. So it's really hard for yeah. a card to, to meet that bar. And because there's just so many options in commander now, there's not even really, there's not very many staple effects that you can look at and be like, Oh, you definitely want this card in two years from now, because it's one of the only cards that does this mm -hmm. but two years from now, they'll print three other things that probably do that. Cause they just push so many, products and new cards now it's, and the actually designed for commander you gotta get your doubling cube you gotta get your doubling <laughs> vorinclex you gotta don't forget your doubling matter reflection oh, and then oh, and then oh, your tripler doubling uh, also we have a tripler <laughs> so like triples the new double get out of here with a weak yeah. ass doubling season well, <laughs> well let, let's talk coming about in 2021 that. tripling season <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, let, I mean, let's talk about that. Uh, Nick's Born Ancient. Um, the card is, what, $17, $18 right now. It's not... It might not no get way. that much lower if the Great Henge is to be believed. I mean, that's possible, yeah. On the other hand, do you think... I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask this question. We'll have the conversation. Uh, is it going to say legal, Jason yeah, yes. and Commander? Of course. Of course. Nick's, Nick's Blue Mage. I think I said Nick's Born. Yeah, Nick's Born. there's you nothing think you, bannable about this card. You, so you base do you think that here's I mean do you think that three tripling your mana is truly really different than doubling your mana? People got very yeah. upset about it. Um, it's, is there a meaningful better. difference? No, it's no. Okay, so the way the card plays is not meaningfully different. What this card upsets me uh, is that they're like, oh, well, triples a new double. Like we we did it, guys. We figured it out. Like it's it's just it, if it just doubled your mana, it would be fine. Like this dies to like disenchant. It's a yeah, you know five power creature does disenchant. Like it, it's not gonna run away with the game, and it's not gonna be the turn you play it. Is, you're not gonna run away with the game. I mean, you can make infinite mana with basalt monolith. I guess the turn you play this, but for the most part, like you're gonna it's gonna go around the table, and it's not gonna mess people up like uh, Vorinclex did. So yeah, um, I, I I don't think that this card is like bannably good. And maybe tripling your mana is not that much better than doubling it. But at the same time, this just sort of signals that they're like, well, we're out of ideas, basically. You know, <laughs> this is how we're going to design cards now. We don't really care about, you know, power level. We we just um, if we have to make a card too good to be exciting and ban something later, that's what we'll do. It just it seems. And you like, think this signifies that? I really wish they hadn't focused on edh because edh was good because every other format sucked and people were like well <laughs> fine edh you can't ruin edh with oko oko's just okay <laughs> in edh so it's fine it was the one format they didn't ruin and they're like wow people are really flocking to edh it's like yeah because you ruined everything else and now they're like why don't we focus on edh i really wish they would have just left edh alone because <laughs> as soon as they start making cards for edh plus cards in the brawl deck designed by people who don't play edh you know, and that affects the format. As soon as they started looking at it, I, w I you know, my butthole puckered because I was like, oh. <laughs> if you if you so, look at the top, the top five commanders from Throne of Eldraine, four of them are Brawl deck commanders. Yeah, I mean, those Brawl decks, I, I think were clearly, a, I think the power level of those commanders was just a mistake. Well, basically. no, they had to be pushed because Brawl sucks because you don't have Soul Ring. Like, I get it. Brawl sucks. It's hard. You have a real small card pool. You need a good commander. But those cards are commander legal, and they they're dumb. Corvold's they dumb. dumb. So Corvold's standard good. Yeah, yeah. Corvold is a messed up magic card. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like I get it to make to make the brawl decks competitive. The fact that they don't have like really ridiculous cards means commander's got to be good. But then you ruin EDH with it. So I really wish they'd left EDH alone. And the fact that they're focusing on EDH just sucks. Okay, and so but I mean, do you think that Nick's Bloom Ancient is is that like is this what you were scared of? It indicates that no, this is the first card. You this don't is think the first, like, you don't like, think like this is the first is... frog that lands on your lawn. You're like, did that frog just fall from the sky? And then like you know, <laughs> it's a biblical plague after that. Then you the, get hit. In the, head the first frog was so small it didn't even hit your house. What are you upset about? Well, yeah, but but, but like. Come on, they've been making commander cards for a decade now, right? The primordial cycle exists, and I, yeah, you know, but those one of, were those are super. Those are I don't so. Know. But is Nick's Bloom Ancient really the one that signals that where you're like the format's in trouble? Yeah. Okay. The canary died. Interesting. See, I think they've been making some messed up commander cards yeah. for a long time. But and that I, I mean, was I on the auspices of add, adding them for other formats. At yeah. least, right? Like, I don't know this, um, because this isn't for any format but EDH. I think that I maybe I'm more scared of just uh, the sheer number of mana doublers slash triplers now. I suppose than but I the, am. You have a finite. You have a finite amount of space for those. It's not like you could even run all of them. Yeah. So okay. like you just you cut. Um, because they're always a must Zendikar kill. resurgent for this or something like that. You know. Interesting. But, okay. I, I mean, just, I, I look at them and I'm just like, man, they're, they're just always must kills and they do feel like they just win the game, basically, if anybody, sometimes immediately, but also when they untap. 
Um, I, especially these double slash tripling versus just adding one additional. Because yeah. cards like this have weird interactions with things like signets. I feel like they spent less time designing this than they did Zendikar Resurgent. That's what I think. This feels like they <laughs> created this very fast. And they're like, oh, we're, you did it. You did it, Jim. And then, like, 2022, they'll be like, ah, quadruple your mana. We did well, it. Well, I mean, it's going to happen at some point, right? <laughs> it's got to. Hopefully my kids are in college by then and I don't have to make money anymore so I don't have to care about the, the market of this game. <laughs> well, I thought Can you that... hold off on Mana Quadruplers until, like, Lily's got scholarships? That'd be great. <laughs> I thought that uh, Nylea's intervention was interesting because, you know, the card Windstorm or whatever, the second half of that card, Redeal Damage to Creatures with Flying, is not good because of the power. Like, the power... Your mana does not scale with the power and toughness of creatures very well anymore. So... Uh, they they put the twice X clause into that, which I thought was also sort of, um, to your point, basically a nod in the direction of we've pushed things so far that this is the only way we can do it now. You know, we basically just have to sort of, we can't design an interesting version of this card. We just have to use the hack of putting two X, right? Because we just recognize that that's the only way we can make this card work. Yeah. And it was it, it's way easier to do that than it is to balance something like Zendikar Resurgent. So you did it, guys. You, you I threw a three on the card. So, I did not expect you to be so negative on this. I knew that there was some pushback to Jason's the quitting commander. He's but... going back to sixty card land. <laughs> I have evidence in the group chat. All right, DJ Cat. What... I feel like Corbin now, but I'm like, what are you talking about? I never said that. <laughs> Jump on, uh, jump on in here. What, do you, what else, uh, Kat? What's, uh, what's another card you have on your list? Um, so I really actually like Thassa's intervention. Uh huh. I think that in standard, it'll actually be like a really good interact. Like we saw Supreme Will saw a lot of play in like the blue black mid range deck. It did. This is yeah. a card that um, just reminds me of Supreme Will, but it scales even better. And I think that it's a card that right now it's only like a TCG low, like a dollar twelve. And I mm -hmm. think it's a card that will actually see a decent amount of play. I think there's just like so, a lot of. Um, this is a four mana like they have to pay four. Well, yeah, this yes. is, so it's X blue blue instant. You choose one of two, uh, like the other intervention. Uh, look at the top X cards of your library. Library put two of them into your hand on the rest on the bottom, or counter target spell unless this controller pays twice X. I agree with so, this one. This was on my list too. This this just this reads very like. It's hyperbolic, but it reads very Sphinx's Revelation esque, where it just fills multiple roles in a deck that you already want it to do, while also scaling into a late game which a control deck also wants to do. I mean, Can't that's wait to pl play against Simic like Flash some more, guys. Yeah, really modality. Modality is good when you have a finite number of deck real estate spaces. Anything that can play two roles is doubly good. It's like a sideboard card main. So, I like all the interventions really, except the the red one seems a little bit lame. Make yeah, the red one it doesn't seems make like trash. It doesn't make X one ones or X two ones or whatever. It makes one X one, and like I don't know. That's yeah. I think that's a little too balanced. I agree. So, Kat, how do you see this? I mean, is this a control card in standard? Is this a mid range card, or is this just high power enough level that it's just an everything card? I I don't think it's an everything card. I think it's gonna be like. Between, if there is, like, a good, like, blue-black sewer deck, I think we would actually see this in there. Because just, like, a three-mana pay two is, like, a really positive tempo play. That can end up being, like, a four-mana yeah, draw yeah. two, five-mana draw, uh, five-mana draw six. A better two. Yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> a better two. But, um, and I think that, yeah, it's a better two. Sorry, it's a dig through time. Um, mm -hmm. And I, did I also think it, it, like, giving control a lot of play and flexibility there. Um, and having one of the controls like biggest issues that Supreme Will was just really good for was it's just like having ways to proactively use your mana if you don't need to react. And I think that, mm -hmm. that card does this. That, this card like does that very well. Yeah, I was gonna say like why couldn't Blue just get um, like uh, Council of the Soratami, but apparently Council of the Soratami needs to be a green card now. So, <laughs> you know, I believe I believe Rosewater said recently that they actually are going to try to pull back on some of the card draw on green because it it frankly it's gotten a little out of control, right? Yes, green has way too much card advantage. Green is supposed if to be anybody... like man efficiency and board state. It is not supposed yeah. to be card advantage. Yeah. If anybody listened to Mark Rosewater, like this wouldn't have gotten printed. 
I guess. Or does he, he gone mad with power? He's like, I will break the color pie. Time spiral block his back. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a card that was printed last year called Morrow's Gone Nuts, right? And it's a green card that yeah. doubles. Like, it's it's all of the worst. <laughs> it's, a well, doubling, it's a doubling card that doubles. Like, we're getting quadrupling season next year. It's If Morrow goes nuts is a doubler, then I guess Morrow's not taking his meds for uh, <laughs> Nick's born. Uh, Nick's bloom. Ancient. Nick's bl- Nick's uh, Nick's born henge ancient. Yeah, learned it, learned it, learn that one well. You're going to have to talk about it a lot, I'm sure, in articles and this podcast in the future. I had to put it in my top ten this week, and I was not happy about it. <laughs> All right, I'll touch on another one here. I think Jason and I both liked this, but uh, Kunaros Hound of Athreos. It's a a weird card, honestly, but it is it's the uh it's the new questing beast, keyboard soup here. It's a three mana three three, one white and a black. Vigilance menace lifelink. Creature cards and graveyards can't enter the battlefield and players can't cast spells from graveyards. Uh so this I think is a very interesting card because it hoses uh obviously the, the biggest one is cat. You can't cat oven mm-hmm. uh because you can't bring the creature back from the graveyard. Uh, but also with Vigilance and Lifelink, and Menis, I guess, basically acting as evasion here, that's a lot of life gain, right? And that's relevant against a lot of, say, the Emperor Cleave decks that are, are around. Um, it's even relevant against stuff like, uh, against some of the Simic decks, if you could ever land it to an extent. Uh, so I actually think this might find a home. I think this is sort of an Esper hero card, if that archetype were to make a comeback. Yeah, this card's this card's messed up. <laughs> so it is very yeah. good. It has a lot of words. Normally, cards with lots of words end up being pretty good. <laughs> yeah, they don't end up being three out. mana three threes. Remember what a three mana three three like was trained like, Armadons? Yeah, <laughs> or it was yeah, it was double green. Yeah. Gnarly, well, you just go back to. Ass. There's another example of that, right? In this set, you just go back to Watch Wolf, and then you got Fleece Main Lion because Watch Wolf wasn't good enough, and now we got like better Fleece Main Lion because Fleece Main Lion isn't good enough. Look, look how far Watch Wolf has come with the the bronze, I think it's Bronze Bane Lion or whatever in this set. Yep, yeah, Bronze Hide Lion, yeah. Bronze Hide Lion, yeah. We've so, come a, a long way from Savannah Lions at Rare. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so, uh, Kunaros is $1.50. Um, like I said, I, I think the power level on the card's definitely there. I think sort of the biggest thing, I don't want to say holding it back, that, but the biggest thing that is going to be a question mark with it and then ultimately informs its price is whether or not a deck exists for it. I agree with that. Uh, right, build a deck around this thing, throw some equipment on it, <laughs> go to town, throw that big old stupid hammer on it. <laughs> I don't think we're, putting, we're not playing Colossal Hammer. Well, you're I'm not. I'm playing Colossal Hammer on my life linker with Menace. Yeah, absolutely. Corbin, you're Coward. not playing Colossal Hammer. <laughs> All right, yeah. fair enough. I mean, Kat, do you think without putting... I mean, obviously we're putting you on the spot a little bit, but, you know, feel free to speak in generalities as much as you want i mean do you think an esper just tell us is putting colossal hammer on this good or is it the best <laughs> thing you can do don't sugarcoat um, it well i think that <laughs> i don't think it's a build around card i do think it's a card that if a deck exists like esper hero exists i mean gucci's always trying to make esper hero work so if a deck yep. there exists it'll, he'll find it um i think that it will go in that kind of build but i'm not sure if one exists for it right now and i could see yeah. it being like a modern sideboard card um, mm-hmm. Which could make it more than a dollar fifty. So that's true too. Actually, I didn't think about that. Uh, taking a step back here, do you see that? Do you see Theros having a major impact on Standard? Because I look at Standard and I see, you know, a Simic Flash deck that's Counterspell, 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 Nightpack Ambusher, and you see a Fires deck that is, you know, Card Search, Card Search, Fires, Cavaliers, and these decks are so powerful just sort of the the cards in them are so good it doesn't feel like a first set standard format to me where decks there are strong things but lots of decks kind of dirtle or have have weaknesses i mean the decks in standard right now feel really powerful is theros enough to really shake up the format or will it be more like this existing deck adds this card and this existing deck adds this card and that's basically it I think it'll be more like this existing decks at these uh-huh. specific cards. I, I just don't really see. I, I think it can, it'll shake up. I think it'll actually shake up Pioneer more than it's going yeah. to shake up Standard, to be honest. Okay. Um, I think that it's going to give 
brief pi- a lot of life into a lot of pioneer decks that are struggling. Like I think we'll actually see an enchantress deck in pioneer yeah, become that's really on the really good. Being a thing, yeah. Um, I think that Ashiok is going to give blue black these blue black based decks more play since Vale's banned, and these decks mm-hmm. are like need these help need this help. Um, and I but I don't in standard it feels like they're just going to kind of like slot in, and I do see yeah. there being um. The only new deck I'd potentially think about would be like a mono black devotion with Bolas, the Citadel, Gary, and Gary, and, yeah. and like Erebos and that kind of stuff. But I think it would still be kind of like building off of like the black red Zactos deck or like the black green food deck and just like mm-hmm. but being more of like a devotion show. You know, I just realized Command the Dreadhorde still exists, also. Speaking of Gary, that's true. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that might be a thing. That sounds kind of fun, actually. That does sound really fun. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, we have exhausted the five on my list. You guys, you all want to jump in? Fast as Oracle. Um, it may be a little bit too much now, but I think it's going to get to a point where you can make money buying it where it ends up. Um, Fast as Oracle seems like a card that could get some play in multiple formats. It's one of those, hey, you win the game cards, and those when they're blue and involve drawing every card in your library like Corbin likes to do with his bullshit zombie deck, um, <laughs> they get play. Yeah, this card is hype for a zombie. It's also a sweet merfolk. It's Dude, got so it, much text, I don't actually know why. Uh, I got you. I got you. Don't worry. I could what watch I'm here the for. Irishman twice in the time it would take me to read this text <laughs> box. It's a, it literally does just the entire text box possible. It's a 1-3 for blue-blue merfolk wizard. It enters the battlefield. Look at the top X cards of your library where X is your devotion to blue. Put up to one of them on top of your library, the rest on the bottom. Then, if X is greater than or equal to the number of cards in your library, you win the game. So if you have one, if you have devotion is two, right? Because that's the baseline with this card and there's one card in your deck, you will win. Yep. It's a lot of words. The card's fairly intuitive, actually, right? It's pretty simple to know what it does. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not that complicated, even though it has a lot of words. So it's yeah. like how they know, used to have cool. to use a paragraph to explain that something died. Yeah, yeah it is very similar, actually. <laughs> Place it into your graveyard. They cannot be returned to your hand. Wheresoever. <laughs> <laughs> Wheresoever. Like alpha and beta cards were clearly written by lawyers and it was amazing. Like, this cannot be retroactively applied. <laughs> And some of them, yeah, just, I mean, some of them were written by five year olds. They're like, "Ruck egg, that can just go to your graveyard. They'll figure it out." <laughs> there are certainly uh, there egg die creature fly. We did it. For those of you who are new, if you ever just uh, you newer to the game that you're not super familiar with Alpha Beta, if you ever are the mood strikes you and you do want to have some fun, just go look at the wording on some of that stuff. It sometimes they have examples. Sometimes those examples don't make sense, and it's just actually in the rules text of the card. Guess what uh, indestructible aura does? I'll give you a hint. It's not indestructible, and it doesn't get like it's not an aura. <laughs> <laughs> it's a picture yeah. of a b- guy in a bird mask, like doing like metal hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the card do? Well, that uh, was that was not even alpha. That was uh, legends. legends. Yeah. That's a that's Mark Pool art, baby. I think it changes the color on something, or prevent, it might prevent damage or redirect damage. All right, I got you. Hold up. Any damage dealt to creature, to target creature, it's an instant. Any damage dealt to target creature for remainder of turn is reduced to zero. Okay, yeah, prevents damage. But the, the, is, I got the color sad. change part because there's a rainbow in the background. That's where it's, that comes from. Yeah, it is it is a bird man with fire on JJ, one side overlay nice. the bird's face onto Weird. Corbin. Please, why? Don't do this. <laughs> Don't listen to him. Target wall can now attack. Target wall's power and toughness are unchanged, even if its power is zero. <laughs> what is that? It's a three hundred dollar card, baby. I like. Uh, <laughs> what, my friend has uh, like a collection of animate walls, and okay. he brought it to the artist one time and asked him to sign it. And the guy said no because he regretted drawing it. He hated the artwork. On an animate wall? Yeah. Well, now I gotta look at it. I mean, it's it's terrible. <laughs> it's really bad. And that's... It's Dan Frazier who, like, whatever. Dan Frazier is probably 22 when he drew this. Like, I will agree. This it's card some is... some chick doing, like, wizard hands, but the wall looks like a Aqua Teen <laughs> Hunger Force character. It's amazing. <laughs> the wall... He's got arms. He's a the... wall. He just but drew he's got a arms and feet. It's amazing. It's he's just got, a like, form. a frowny face. Yeah. 
This is copyright infringement. That's what this is. <laughs> Ripped this straight out of Nintendo, man. It's like Thwomp is a character that exists, and Anime Wall is the Thwomp. That's the, Please let me die. That's the episode I wasn't title. meant to live in this world. That's the episode I have a mouth, title. but I can't eat food. Animate Wall was a thwomp. No kidding. This is like I kind of think I'd have to pay this thing five coins to let to go past it. That was a Mario Party reference. There is no limit to the size of your hand. If a card forces you to discard, you may choose to discard to the top of your library rather than to the graveyard. If discard is random, you may look at card before deciding where to discard it. And then listen to this. Here's the errata. You have no maximum hand size. And if effect causes you to discard, discard it, but you may put it on top of your library instead of your graveyard. So, yeah. like, half the text. You guys are reading off old cards, but you're not even reading off the most notorious one. Um, you, go on. You may rearrange your attacking creatures and place them face down, revealing which is which only after defense is chosen. If this results in impossible blocks, such as non-flying creatures blocking flying creatures, illegal blockers cannot block this turn. Camouflage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I... I... Something embarrassing happened, and I have to admit to it. It's not Thwomp, it's Womp. Ooh. Womp is the block that comes down. Womp is the walking wall. Oh, the one in uh, in Mario 64 where you bait it into... And then it's got, like, a band-aid on the back of its head, like Marcellus be... Wallace in Pulp Fiction. And then you gotta, like, do the Z-stomp and land on its back. Is that, that was, Womp? That was 100% accurate, yes. Okay. Cool. It's also the womp you have to pay to pass in Mario Party One. Anyways, I was I was. I... We can, it's not like old sets had like were the only ones with bad because like in Kaladesh we got your artifacts can help you cast those spells. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Hey, that was that That's was true. eight through That was eight through We we get some good ones with you know uh, Obsidian Fireheart is my personal favorite. It puts a burn counter or blaze the counter or something on the land. The land continues to burn after the... And the, 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 continues the, to burn. the reminder text, not the flavor text or any... The reminder text of the ability says the land continues to burn even after the card leaves the graveyard, the battlefield. Which is neat. And we get, you know, now we've got the, the new cards that say they escape with a plus one, plus one counter or whatever. That's very flavorful. Mm-hmm. So they've come a long way. But seriously, Animate Wall is a joke. <laughs> I like that it had feet and hands before it was animated. It's like, why do you have a face, dog? Like, who who carved? It's like a Meeseeks existence is pain. This is... The Please let me attack, even, even if my power is zero. The face isn't even proportional to its body. No. Right? That's the worst. It's just, it's just That's creepy. It's not a good wall. It's only like eight feet wide. Also, like what? what are yeah, you and it's in the middle. With that? It's just in the middle of a field. <laughs> I really hope somebody is listening to this, gripping their steering steering wheel, because they wanted top tier finance information on which card to buy out at the pre release. <laughs> I hope Dan Frazier's listening. He's like, "Oh, you don't like my wall." <laughs> <laughs> Pulls a Yui on the highway and starts driving toward Michigan. <laughs> okay, I legit have a question about this card, though. Do we think that the chick doing the magic cans is making it? come alive at this moment or is yes. it already alive oh but listen oh because it's cowering? in the middle of a field it's an eight foot wall in the middle of a field with nothing on any side of it so is it not also likely that the wall is in the process of chasing her down and she's like no it has zero power <laughs> well, well, she's building a house the wall was womp. an 08 and it they could wouldn't print the, yeah. Maybe she doesn't see the bandaid on the back of its head. She's, they couldn't womp until Doran. Like that was that swinging for zero. Like you can tank that damage, babe. Just like it's, it'll be fine. <laughs> no, there, she's building a house. That's the first brick. There's more than one. You <laughs> said okay. Maybe that's it. I, that's a weird card. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dan. But I understand why you wouldn't sign this. It's fine. He got the well, five mocks in. He'll he'll be able to eat tonight. <laughs> if well, someone asked cool, me to we'll sign, that sign card, your indestructible auras, <laughs> if I if I if I had drawn that card and someone asked me to sign it i'd be like yeah sure hand me a sharpie and i would just sharpie over the entire art <laughs> just just drown that thing out uh, this is a rata <laughs> <laughs> all right so is there anything else uh we haven't touched on anyone got cards left they want to talk about 
Yeah, man. Uh, we didn't talk about the Akroan War, which is probably the cheapest rare in the set that has some potential to do something. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I think okay, the, great. The, Ak- so the Akroan Akro- War is a, it's a saga for four mana. Um, mm-hmm. The first mode is you gain control of target creature for as long as your Akroan War remains on the battlefield, which is not a typical threat and effect because no. you will get it for a couple of turns. The second mode is until your next turn, creatures your opponent controls attack each combat if able. So, like, not great that you're making them swing, but goading is always useful because, like, if they weren't swinging for a reason, then, like, you're going to make them make some bad swings. Third mode, each tapped creature deals damage to itself equal to its power. So you're going to steal something, you're going to goad them into swinging into the creature you stole, and then anything that's tapped from swinging just kills itself. So... This is uh, not quite a Red Wrath, per se, but, like, I I think the fact that, like, threat and effects are good at three mana, and this is four, and you get it for more than one turn, plus it could, like, potentially make them make some bad decisions and kill some of their creatures. I think this is a... This is not an 80-cent card, is what I'm saying. I agree with you. I think there's also so much sacrifice currently, like, in Standard, and mm-hmm. in this set, this card will be very good. But with stealing cards, like, Claim to the Firstborn is already being played pretty consistently. Yeah, um, yeah. And so I think it's going to be, like, I think it's a really good card. So you're never going to give the creature back to them? Jund no. Sacrifice uh, Mirrors? Yeah, I mean, the, what we're, the worst we're case scenario Corvolt is that, this? like, you make them run their creature into their creature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're sealing Corvolds with this, right? Or in the black red shell, which plays like Priest mm-hmm. of the Forgotten Gods. That's also true, yeah. And I with like the new and with Woe Strider and the having a new sack outlet, I think it'll be mm-hmm. really good. I'm kind of hype on this card. Also actually. on my five under five. Yeah, it's I mean it's real cheap, so definitely look at yeah. picking this one up. Because uh, Woe Strider is one of those cards like people are playing Viscera Seer for the Scry effect. But people are also playing uh, Yeheni as a three mana like sack effect, and mm-hmm. they're they're sacking creatures to Yeheni's make Yeheni indestructible ability, which keeps Yeheni on the board. Um, Wolf Strider, you will have to sack some stuff to bring it back if it dies. You know you can't make it indestructible, but like you can just bring it back. You'll yeah. get another Go Token when you replay it. Um, I. I kind of think the decks are the, some of the decks that are running uh, Yeheni. They won't cut Viscera Seer, but they might cut Yeheni for Woe Strider because I think it's just better. This and, is also, uh, uh, I mean, this just screams this combo there. to me, right? Like this is just a combo piece and uh, uh, like a rally type deck for sure. It combos real well with the Crone War, right? You it sure does. <laughs> yeah. Borrow their creature and then sack it and scry one. So yeah, I hadn't really I thought through. Scry I'm ones you... draw half a card, so I I think if you um. I don't know. Sacrificing stuff in in standard and in certain builds is fine, but sacrificing stuff in EDH is always great because you have so many expendable tokens. Uh, Well, let's spend a second and talk about the most expensive card in the set, uh, Euro, the 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 giant, the primeval, the the titan rather, a la primeval titan, grave titan. It's uh, pretty expensive right now, twenty five plus dollars. A lot of places. I'll, I'll read it quickly in case you can't remember the broken card. It's three mana, one blue green. It's a six six. Uh, the first time it enters the battlefield, you have to well, you have to sacrifice it when it enters unless it escaped. However, when it enters the battlefield or attacks, you gain three life, draw a card, then you can put a land from your hand on the battlefield, and the escape is blue, blue, green, green. Exile five other cards from your graveyard. Does this have any business being twenty five dollars? It might. Something has to be expensive, right? Maybe. Kat, what do you think? I think this card is going to see a lot of modern play. I think the Semic uh, Titan mm-hmm. decks, probably, yeah. even if Oko was still legal, I think you would play Uro over Oko. Because I think this oh. card is just, yeah, I really, I think this card is very, very powerful in that. There's fetch, first of all, you also have your fetch lands in that version of it. You have yeah. Steve's, um, you also have Steve, you have Search for Tomorrow. So you have a lot of ways to fill up your graveyard to, to escape mm-hmm. it. The fact that you can also, um, I think it makes it, it being a better explore. I, I don't want to play explore in those decks. I want to play search for tomorrow. So it lets me have an explore effect there. Um, that also then like is really great late game. Um, I could even see potentially Amulet Titan playing this deck. I'm not 100% on that for playing this card, but I think it's going to see a lot of modern play. I, if this were a, a sorcery that didn't have a 6-6 body attached to it, I think... I would pay three mana for that 
comes into play effect for sure. Like can, I, I think it's I think it's that good. Can we just talk about how good uh, Cavernous Souls naming Elder is getting in Commander these days? Can we also talk yes. about how it's, a, it's the same uh, type as Primeval Titan in Modern? It's a <laughs> <Yes>. giant. <laughs> also, <laughs> s- that one might be a little more relevant. <laughs> Yeah, this, so. I mean, this, we talked about this card a lot last week. I think the card's silly, but I also think that it's probably, like, fine from a balance perspective. It's just very good. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, like, you know, something in the set's got to be... Look, you got so a $27 right, card and a $25 <laughs> card and an $18 card. And right now we have a 28 a 25 and an 18 So I don't know if these are the three cards that are going to get there, but I feel like... You're right. Something's going to have money. Yeah. So if something goes way down, something's going to have to come way up, and maybe it's Clothis, maybe it's... I think Dry to the Elysian Grove is not going to maintain 14, so it's going to be like Ashiok going up, it's going to be like maybe Croxa going up, but, you know, I think Nyx Lotus and uh, and Dryad are on their way down. Agreed. So it's going to have to be another Mythic that's currently under $12, getting above 20 if these cards aren't the two that maintain above 25 Well, let's talk Otherwise, about Otherwise, these boxes aren't going to be worth anything, and they don't want that. Yeah, let's talk about Ashiok then, because I think this card's actually pretty good. It's a five mana, three blue, black, five loyalty planeswalker. Uh, plus one, create a two, three blue and black illusion uh, nightmare creature token that whenever it attacks or blocks, each opponent exiles the top two of their library. Minus three, return target non land permanent to its owner's hand. Then they exile a card from their hand. And minus seven, you may cast up to three face-up cards your opponents own from exile without paying their mana costs. Um, It's a lot of words, but look, I see a Planeswalker that comes down, makes a creature that protects itself with with value, going up to six, and the minus is also very good. You know, I there is more Planeswalker removal than ever before, especially in Standard, so I think, you know, getting this thing Murders Rider probably doesn't feel great, and bouncing, you know, adventure creatures also probably not exactly where you want to be. But I do think just the power level on the card is is sort of there. Uh, I, do we think that this is a candidate for for going up in price? Yeah. What is it at right now? Twelve. It's ten. It's ten dollars right now. But it down uh, from forty. Mark market I mean, price. 10 forty was not a real number. Yeah, well, I, I mean, uh, it's it's been steadily down. I think the cards kind of look the perfect five mana planeswalker. Like I think mm-hmm. it's like a perfect balance, perfectly balanced planeswalker. Yes, I think it's yeah. powerful. I think I think think it'll see play. I don't think I would personally buy them if I wasn't going to play them at ten dollars. Yeah, this card yeah, well, reads I, like I, I, just a, a twenty fourteen designed five mana planeswalker. <laughs> yeah, it's a it is it that's I played with it in the the arena event that they had where you could play this or the Elspeth deck and both of them were just like these are how planeswalkers are supposed to be yeah <laughs> but i mean That's you'll weird. lose you'll lose five dollars a copy worst case scenario and you'll probably gain five dollars a copy worst case scenario yeah. so it's great. not a great bet so yeah, I, would, I, I would buy these to play with probably yeah but like you you have the same odds of losing the same amount of money as you do gaining it yeah i mean i i, I don't that. think i'm buying it 10 um, in fact, I'm pretty confident that I'm not. But like I said, the money, like we said, the money has to go somewhere. So there's not a lot of sort of candidates for it, right? When you look at what well, we need, something to be mythic, we need it to be uh, played. Lothus is certainly possible. It's three mana, four five, red green, indestructible god claws. Uh, at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a land, add red or green. Otherwise. You gain two and cloth as deals two. I think this card certainly has a place if people are playing cat decks. It it pressures it a little bit. It can it can hit some of their other stuff. It sort of you know helps the the life against a lot of those decks. I mean, there's obviously you have to do some work to ever get their cat with it, but it, it is something that just sort of puts a little pressure on on those type of decks that didn't exist before. If you can. And probably mm. slots pretty decently into some of the Gruel decks. I think the card's come. like fine. Yeah, I'm not excited about it. I think it's another. It's, it's another ten dollar card. So what are you excited about, Cat? Uh, I'm excited about Euro. I'm excited mm-hmm. about Croxa, the the black red um, yeah, the, giant. I think yeah. that card is sick. I'm yeah. excited about the Ox. 
Um, the Mythic Ox. The Mythic Ox. Like that card's Ox really, really cool. Ox of Agonas. Yes. Those are probably the three cards that I'm the most hyped about in this set. Okay, so let's start with the Ox. The Ox is uh, six, six dollars right now. It's a three and two red. It's a four, two. When it enters the battlefield, discard your hand, then draw three. Escape. Which is a card we've seen before. Yes, a pretty good one, as it turns out. Escape, mm-hmm. two red mana, exile eight cards from your graveyard. It escapes with a plus one counter on it. Where where you see, what sort of role do you see this card filling? I mean, is this the next coming of Bedlam Reveler? I think this is going to be seen, potentially see play in Modern Dredge. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that in the Tome Scour versions fill up the graveyard very, very easily. Um, yeah. Especially with like Merchant of Ale and just like a lot of really good enablers right now that are just like blind cards, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think this slots better into the current builds of Dredge where you have less control over what's actually going in your yard because you don't have Faithless right. Holding anymore. And I think right. that this card will be really good there. Um, and actually yeah, bring yeah, new mean, life into the deck. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the double red... Because the thing, obviously, about Bedlam Reveler is that by the time you cast it, right, it's very cheap. Yeah. Um, but you're right. This has a completely different angle on this card is that it can escape for two red. And if you, I mean, Dredge is the deck that can get those cards in its graveyard. And yeah. then it's obviously the perfect ability for Dredge. Yeah, With the exactly. dr- discard draw three. I think that it so you like be very you like Tome Scour over Cathartic Reunion as a pairing for this card? Um, it wouldn't be over Cathartic. It would probably be over Merchant of Veil. Um, okay that slot or the three corn slot potentially maybe yeah i wonder about pioneer the dredgeless dredge deck uh, i wonder if that's a thing it's not red currently but i wonder if this is isn't, isn't that, that green black it's so yeah, tight it, yeah yeah it's not a it's not a red deck currently the question is would this be enough to uh to push it there I don't know. That deck's weird because it's a, we call it Dredgeless Dredge, but it it has, I mean, it has That's zero That's because you're cards. in charge of naming the decks. I'm surprised <laughs> you didn't call it John Midrange. John Midrange, yeah. I give decks good names. What are you talking about? Oh, John, you just listened. Hey, Corbin, do you want to tell us about the Lantern deck you named? Yeah, I named it Lantern Control. <laughs> he did it. Do you get it? Because it controls people's decks with a lantern. Also... <laughs> Sad face, I have a foil lantern deck because I love playing it, and now I can't play it. Nope. Or Mox Opals. Mox Opal needed to go on Modern. We'll talk a lot more about Modern next Mox week. Mox Opal died for Urza's sins. Yeah, just pour one out for me not getting to play my lantern deck. I love playing that deck. Mox Opal did not die for Urza's sin. Mox Opal had its own sins. It needed to go. <laughs> Mox Opal got It needed like... to go for six years, and it still kept limping well, along somehow. Yeah, the, the... And faith, it and Faith was living. Thank God they're gone. Yeah, I agree. I just want Birth and Pod back. No. I just want to pod into a Renegade no. Rally at one time. <laughs> nope. <laughs> and bring back a Phantasma image and copy my Renegade Rally. Yeah. Cute. <laughs> what, like people right, are Urza, Urza-ing and Oko-ing, but I can't play a <laughs> four-mana artifact yeah, that right? bolts me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, that is correct. Exactly how you just said. <laughs> That's what we have determined from trial and error. Uh, less, I think this is probably the last card we really need to talk about is Heliod Suncrowned. Everyone's up in arms about this card. Well, it's already Pioneer. on the watch list. That's yep. the first time I've ever seen an article where they're like discussing bannings. And they're also like, you ought to notice Heliod. I thought that was... Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they said... I mean, because... I think I like the idea, right? For those who don't know what we're talking about, obviously the the, the ban list article that announced the bannings of uh, Oko, Mox, and uh, Lattice in Modern also had a, had a paragraph that said, we're aware of the community buzz surrounding Heliod and Pioneer, and if it's a problem, we'll look at it then. But yeah, it really served up notice that this is, you know, just because we printed this after Pioneer came out does not mean that we have decided it's fine for Pioneer yep. in advance. Um, which is which is actually a nice message because when Splinter Twin got banned, a lot of people didn't see it coming for a lot of reasons, but also because it had just been reprinted. You know, that sort of signaled that they felt the card was fine enough that they wanted more of them out there. And I think that uh, that, that was one of the many contributing factors to sort of the everlasting anger that is people salty over the twin ban but it, it's a legitimate complaint and I, th- I like that they went out of their way here to say 
that's not the case with Heliod. If it's a problem, be prepared. I agree. I think it's really good they did that. And I think that it'll definitely see a lot of play. Yeah, so the card is, uh, it's about, it's, it's, it's 15 to $20 most places. Um, for those, the, the quick recap, it's a three mana, five, five, God Claws. Uh, when you gain life, put a one, one counter on creature or enchantment you control. Uh, another creature gains life to link until end of turn for two mana. So combos with Ballista, uh, etc. So what do we think of that price for it? 15 to 20. No. Don't do it. Do you think this is a standard card cat, or is this just basically a combo piece with, with, with uh, pioneer decks? Um, I'm trying to think about all of the life gain. There is a decent amount of life gain in standard right now. Just like there's a little bit of a black white life gain deck that exists. Yeah, so to where it could actually end up seeing some some standard play just because there is a, a decent amount of life gain and standard in the black and white colors and in this set mm-hmm. and in previous sets and so i could see it seeing standard play but i don't um it's not one that i immediately look at and go oh yeah this is definitely gonna be a standard staple but i could definitely yeah. see it, it potentially having a home so i think we probably all agree even if it goes on to be very good in pioneer that price is probably a little little too much hype yep. yes i agree all right Okay, well, any other cards you all want to talk about before we get out of here this week? Uh, Satessin Champion looks interesting. Mm -hmm. But as I talked about a week or two ago, it is not a card that you want to buy immediately. It's sort of like Fires of Invention, which is neat because those cards go in the same deck. But it is something that you want to keep your finger on the pulse of and just wait until all the other crazy high-powered stuff goes away that is obviously better than it. Uh, but green creature-based card advantage engines that also get powerful are not to be overlooked in standard if we have anything to learn from Tireless Tracker and Corsair of Crufix and yeah. a bunch of other three, green three drops over the past few years. And so this is just something I want to be looking at when Ravnica block rotates and when we just have a smaller card pool and just looking at things like Fires of Invention or other uh, value-based enchantments where you just bury your opponent in card advantage and mana advantage. But like it's a dollar, it's a dollar fifty. You can pick them up in trades or whatever at throw-ins, um, if mm-hmm. if that's still a thing. But I mean, just like it's just something. If if it ever goes down to fifty cents, just buy ten of them and wait. Uh, it's that kind of card. Okay. Uh, idyllic tutor is like seven fifty right now. Nah, this is a two dollar card for like a year. Yep. Yeah. Remember when it was a forty dollar card? That was fun. Yeah, man. <laughs> I remember all kind of stuff about the <laughs> history of magic. Yeah. All right. Kat, anything else uh, you want to talk about this week? No, not nothing for me. Great. Well, thank you again for coming on for this set review. Let people know uh, where they can find you and support you across the internet. Um, I'm always on Twitter at HellcatMTG. And then you can also find me on YouTube uh, at HellcatMTG, where I do a bunch of like tournament vlogs, which I'll have another one coming out in the next week or two. So. Yeah, there you go. Go check it out, everybody. I think that does it for the set review. This was painless, right? Yeah, this is a lot of fun. We survived? Yeah. (laughs) We did it. I can't feel anything, so technically. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, well, everybody, thank you for listening. Kat, thanks again for coming on. Enjoy your Theros Beyond pre-releases this weekend. And uh, while you're there, maybe share the podcast with a friend, everybody. This is Brainstorm Brewery. Don't say maybe. Tell them to do it. (laughs) <laughs> don't just kindly suggest it that's how that's not uh-huh. how, well maybe I'm... you should kind of uh, no spread this like a virus <laughs> play this at the table get people about that finance life there you go I, I... different approaches <laughs> everybody thank you for listening uh, we'll see you next week Hey, Corbin has a captive audience at an LGS, and he's failed to convert even a single person. Different approaches. We alienated half our listeners.